Hello, my name's Matt Cameron, and I'm a community group leader with the Salesforce Marketing Cloud Developers Group. Today, we're going to learn more about Interaction Studio with Chris and Justin. This is part one um, of an amazing, awesome journey to learn more. Enjoy. Short and sweet, but just wanted to thank everyone for coming today, both in person and online. Um, this has been about two years in the making. I've been pestering Matt for about six months, trying to get us going in person again. And for those who I assume can't see in the room, we've got about 40 people in the room, which is a pretty good turnout. It's almost like it's 2019 again, pre-pandemic. So yeah, thanks for everyone for coming. Enjoy the drink, enjoy the food, and enjoy the presentation. Thanks, Nick. Okay, Matt, don't go too far. I'm going to, I want you to keep an eye on just the polls because we're going to do a bit of uh, Q and A just before we get started. If you can on your, you got the like you can see everyone doing the chat thing. My screen is being shared to everyone. So first of all, please uh, bear with us as we kind of transition from in person to virtual presenter. But today's agenda <clears throat> is going to be broken up as follows, and I want everyone just to appreciate for a moment that we are made up of a big mix of audience. We have people in the audience today who have been head first into Marketing Cloud and know nothing about what Marketing Cloud personalization, formerly known as Interaction Studio, can do. On the other end of the spectrum, we have people. You might need to be this close. I need to be this close for the mic. On the other end of the spectrum, we have those folks who are well and truly into the weeds of Marketing Cloud personalization. So we have people from both sides. And actually, that's where I want to firstly do a bit of a survey. So as I ask the room, um, Matt, if you can keep an eye on the survey, uh, can I get everyone just to raise your hands if you've never seen or you've never worked with Marketing Cloud Personalization or Interaction Studio before ever? Raise your hands. Oh, yeah, so there's about almost half of the room here. And what about online? Are we getting, online, if you can just hit like yes, just capital Y and then hit enter and we'll, uh, and we'll get a bit of a count. No idea. Yes, yes, no, no. I'll tell you, you've got 50-50. 50-50. So that's why we've got today's agenda the way it is, right? We can't, for those of you who are already on the tools in Interaction Studio and want to know, you know, the intricacies of React Native and, and Interaction, you know, and, and that sort of stuff, we'll take a step back. This is actually the first time that we are talking about Marketing Cloud personalization to the Marketing Cloud Developers Group. And when I was first approached to sort of talk about this, we had to sort of take a step back and realize, hang on, the audience that we're speaking to is two very different sides. So I like to think that this could be the first of maybe several sessions. So the first agenda item we're gonna be speaking to, I'll be speaking to, is firstly, an end user experience. The best way to show what, you know, how to do real-time personalization marketing. Like, the best way to actually explain it is in the shoes of the customer. And that's what I'll be walking through. Now, this full thing usually takes like half an hour. We, we don't have time for that. We're all smart people in the room. I'm going to be nexting my way through it really, really quickly. I just want to give you a taste of everything that there is. From there, I'll jump into the back end, a little bit of the foundations, and then we'll get stuck into the sitemap and some campaigns. And just like to give you a really quick example of how to do real-time personalization on the web as one channel. From there, because web is quite important, we'll then head over to Josephine from OSF Digital. And she will be doing a bit of a deeper dive into uh, some of the learnings that uh, she's experienced. And she'll be talking about website architecture, data, privacy, and just really a bit of a deeper dive into the sitemap and some things uh, to be aware of. And from there, we'll probably have a bit of Q&A, right? We're not going to throw all the Q&A to the end. We'll pause, have a bit of Q&A. We want to get your experience, have a bit of discussion about some of that sitemap stuff, some issues, some questions, and so on. Then we'll go a little bit deeper into the platform beyond just web, right? Because the title of today's session is how to do website personalization, sorry, how to do real-time personalization uh, with uh, Interactive Studio, or marketing that personalization. But personalization isn't just across one channel. Salesforce believes that that, that real-time personalization needs to happen on any channel, right? On any channel, and that is key, right? And you think about it in your own lives. Right, you interact with a customer with a brand in the app, and then for some reason you go to the website because you clicked on an email from your desktop, and then you walk in store, and then you have an issue and you deal with the service center. Right, 
you interact with companies across so many different channels. And so personalization is important, not just on one or two, but across all. And that's what marketing life personalization is about. So um, that's all nice, but um, you know, this is a developers group, right? So we're gonna get into the weeds. And it's at this point that I will just do a quick introduction of myself. See, I'm a solutions engineer and my role is that I work in pre-sales. So my job is to speak to customers, understand their pain points, their challenges, what they're trying to achieve, and then show them how marketing that personalization can help them. What that means though, is that I have zero implementation experience. And that's why I'm very well supported by people like Josephine from Marvel Set Digital, by the legend Daniel Poundy that's sitting over there, and by many of you that are sitting here. So I'm going to be leaning on yourselves just to, to share some of those implementation experience stories. So we've got a great mix of uh, audience here today, but these are some of the different elements, right? Developers group, we want to understand how do things work? What can I do? How does it connect to marketing cloud? How can I leverage machine learning? Right? How do I supercharge my emails to be personalized, to be relevant to what someone's doing on the web or what they've interacted with the service center and so on? This, for anyone who's ever been, hands up who's been working in marketing cloud for more than three years. Raise your hands. Okay. Everyone remembers behave, what was before behavioral triggers. Right, everyone remembers that, right? But now you're going to see something pretty awesome with this. So that's pretty cool. Promotions, all sorts of things. Now, to cover all this, that would be like me trying to cover everything inside of Marketing Cloud in the space of one hour and 45 minutes. Well, let's all laugh. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. And you're right, it is ridiculous. Um, so we're not going to do that. We're going to be doing an overview. That's why I've got the word overview here. Because at the end of today, we're going to put out a survey. All right, I'm going to do an overview, cover all the different things, and then we're going to do a survey to ask you, what do you want to go deeper on next time? Again, mix of audience, all right? How does that sound, everyone? Can I get a big shout? Does that, if that sounds okay, yeah, come on. Yes, thank you. All right, good. And then to bring us home, we've got Josephine again, going a bit deeper into data architecture, um, talking about these things here, which I have forgotten to update the agenda item. But let's keep going. All right, let's get started. We'll hop on over here and we're going to get right into the first agenda item, which is an introduction. Now, like I said, this here is going to be the day in the life of a customer. And I'm going to be stepping through a fictitious customer as they interact with Northern Trail Outfitters. Some of you may be very well versed with others, may have no idea what this is, but this is going to give you a bit of a taste as to how Marketing Cloud Personalization, formerly known as Interaction Studio, I'll be interchanging those terms, um, and what it actually means. Along the way, we're going to be focusing strongly on the experience of the customer. That makes sense, right? This is freaking marketing tech. This is the coolest technology we can be working with. It is important that we focus on what the end user experience is. But along the way, I'll be showing you just a couple of snapshots of what's happening behind the scenes. They're screenshots. They're not real, but don't worry, right? I'm a developer. I will be jumping into the platform and showing you some tech stuff later. So let's get going. This is a fictitious retailer. And for those of you who are going, oh, retail, I don't work in retail. Don't worry, because Elliot Harper couldn't be here today, but I have chosen his company's website as an example of a real life demonstration, which is the exact opposite of retail, sort of. Anyway, um, this is a fictitious retail website, a visitor lands. We don't know who they are. They are completely anonymous, right? There is a generic uh, homepage banner here talking about adventure and so on. And this company sells outdoor hiking uh, and, and, and clothing and that kind of equipment. And this visitor is going to visit uh, a category page of women and footwear, and they're going to go looking at running footwear. And they're completely nice, but they're browsing. And you know what? They're going to go ahead and, and, and hit one of these filters on the left and limit it by some uh, we've hit by running gear. And this Roverito shoe looks pretty good. And we'll go ahead and look at this shoe. All right, we can see some live information here, 82 people currently viewing and so on, that's all good. I'm gonna scroll down and you know spend a bit of time on this page. We've got some recommendations here, which happen to be powered by Marketing Cloud Personalization, but never mind that. And that's all good. Now, let's have a look behind the scenes what's going on. Just from that initial behavior, click, 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 Salesforce Personalization is listening. And what does that mean? Well, I'm looking here at my recent visitors and this person has not identified themselves. It's the first time on the site, so, we are gonna go and look at their user record. They are completely anonymous. That means that we don't know who they are. We know roughly where they're from, from IP address, lookup and so on, but obviously they haven't made any purchases and so forth. 
Uh, we have some very basic attributes, right? Maybe, um, you know, what Google AdWords, maybe they clicked on and so on, what product. But the real star of the show is up here, the affinity wheel. As customers are interacting with different products, different content, different blog posts, whatever it might be on the site, these are stored inside of Interaction Studio. They are not authored there, but it has a shadow catalog, so to speak. And because they are attributed by all these different elements here, we start to develop a bit of a profile, a bit of affinities, right? Like this particular person has uh, an affinity towards running because they look at running shoes, right? These style codes, these particular elements, these item class waterproof, they're interested in waterproof and lightweight and that sort of thing. And that's nice. And we also have an event stream, right? So all the different actions are also tracked in real time as all the events are happening. And that's all nice. Um, bit of a snapshot as to how that affinity will happen. Well, like I said, each of the products are stored here. And so over here on the right, we have that women's rubbery issue living in marketing cloud personalization as a record. And here are all the different um, elements here that make up breathable, lightweight, right? Gender, women, and so on, right? So there is that knowledge of the products inside of marketing our personalization. So that as our customers are coming to the site, we're developing those affinities and they're all changing and happening in real time. And that's all lovely. Uh, and in fact, um, we're also able to use that information to generate things like recommendations, such as the similar items that we saw and interaction share here, personalization is gonna be able to give you that, give the market the ability to generate these kinds of recommendations and even see what they look like. For anyone in the room who has mucked around with Einstein recommendations, raise your hand. Einstein Rex, Marketing Cloud. Yeah, this is like 10 times better. Trust me, I've been down that road. This is amazing. All right, let's keep going. Now they come back to the site. So they've, they've abandoned, or maybe it's even in the same session because marketing and personalization is real time, right? But in the session now, on the homepage, this little bit of banner here is now personalized. Why? Well, their affinities were towards running, right? They were towards their thing. So now we've got not just, see, it's not just about product recs, right? For those who raise their hand, oh yeah, I know Einstein product recs, yeah. But that's not personalization. That's just recommendations of specific items. What's the next best action? What's the next best promotion? We're seeing that here. The trail awaits, go shop running, go jog with friends and so on. So this person's gonna go ahead uh, and go screw that on board and they're gonna go and uh, exit intent and they're gonna be called out here. So yes, personalization, sure, but while we're at it, right, we might as well serve up these kinds of things, right? Exit intent, pop-ups, banners, whatever it might be, right, as a way to try and capture them. So this person's gonna go ahead and join the community and I'm about to go a lot faster now because I've been talking for too long and we're not further enough down the path. So they go ahead and log in the community and the purpose of talking about this is because now they're in a completely different environment. I mean, it's owned by the same company, but it's like the portal site, the URL's different, doesn't matter, right? Marketing guide personalization is there, it's listening, right? And it's tracking all the things they're looking at. They're looking at uh, a feed here and they're reading like what are the best shoes and they're, they're, they're monitoring all this stuff, right? All the different behavior and now that, They've done that. Let's have a look at their profile on the back end. We know who they are now. They logged in, Rachel Morris. Turns out they've already bought something from us, right? So a previously existing record has now been merged in with that anonymous profile. And it turns out they've actually bought something from us before. And now we can look at their affinities by purchases. This is super important. The way you do personalization, right? When you think about how do I personalize the next experience? What are they interested in? Well, how are we going to decide that? Is it going to be based on what they've purchased or what they've been looking at or how long they've been looking at something, right? Marketing that personalization is going to give you all that. And we'll dive into all of that and how it works a little bit later. Let's keep going. Uh, so now they've decided they're back on the, back on the site now. This is looking good. Uh, what are they going to do now? They're going to go, all right, well, I'm not really sure. Maybe I might, uh, I might trigger up a service in, in, uh, interaction here because I don't want to buy a shoe online, right? I have a question. So I'm going to click on this chat. And they're going to enter in some information. Why am I doing this? Can anyone raise it? Can anyone guess why I'm doing this? Why is this demo going down this path? Anyone? Yes? What did I say before? Personalization isn't just personalizing the web or personalizing emails. It's every single touch point that customers have. So we're in effort to start a chatbot thing. Hello, I'm, I'm your chatbot. And yes, I'd like to find an item in store and blah, blah, blah. And that's all nice. And, and they're, they're going through this process. What would you like? Yes, I'm interested in this product and, and so on. And would you like to book something? There's a whole service play here. And that's nice. It's not super 
marketing cloud specific, but that doesn't matter. You know what matters? How does, if a customer is using Salesforce Service Cloud, for example, how does that connect to Service Cloud? Everything that just happened, all right? And this is how, why is that important? Well, if a service rep or even a sales agent, depending on the industry, is actually speaking to this customer, they wanna be empowered by knowing what is this person interacting with online, all right? What are they interacting with? What are they interested in, et cetera, et cetera. And what we see here, we've got a little uh, a tab here, are some next based products. Now this is a direct integration for any of you curious, go online, go to the app exchange, right? Search for this, it's a plug and play thing, you plug it in. And this is literally creating these next best actions powered by right, Interaction Studio or Marketing Personalization, right? Same thing. So what we're seeing here are these next best products based on what this person, this Rachel person has been looking at, we wanna make sure that we recommend these as the next best products that go with the running shoe. We don't wanna recommend you know, something they've already bought. What's, what about the content? It's not just about products. Not just about products. Content is very, very important, right? They might be interested in this, right? The Great Outdoors and Avengers. What's the next best action? Hey, there's a promotion that's to do with, you know, fitness and footwear and so on, right? There's an in-store promotion. So all of this, this next best thing, right, that the service agent, uh, you're basically empowering the service agent here to have a really, really great conversation that they know them. That's personalization. All right, fast forward, they go in store, right? This is great. They go in store, they've got an app, some stuff happens. I'm gonna skip forward over here. And uh, they open up the app and there's, a, there's an in-app campaign again, right? In-app, another channel. But maybe they've opened up the app. We wanna be able to personalize that app experience and we're doing that right now. We know they're looking for the perfect running shoe, which is great. Or maybe they don't have the app. Maybe they get an email instead. And this time the email has just the right thing. Right? The, the, the details don't matter. The, the, the concepts here, no matter what the channel, you need to have a central personalization brain that is in charge of personalizing that experience. And that is what this, this product is all about. And of course, based on what's happening, maybe we want to trigger something, right? Into Journey Builder, right? Because they've entered in store, because they've clicked on something or because the service agent, you know, said something or clicked on something and then we're able to trigger something. And that's great, right? And there's interconnectivity between Market Cloud and that. And of course, you know, based on what's going on in the email, we want to make sure that the uh, call to action is relevant, right? What is the next best action? The next best action, this person to join the loyalty program. These are the next best products. I will show you how this is all done. Don't worry. But anyway, and then finally, we end up with a, a much richer, right? Rachel Morris profile. This is a personalization profile inside of Interaction Studio where we can see a much richer profile. And this is forever evolving, this, this affinity wheel. It's so important. No matter what channel they, they engage on, this is constantly evolving. And that's important because the next thing, the next thing they do, the next interaction they have needs to be personalized. And this is what's doing it. All right, that'll do us. Is that to do us? Yes, we're back to the start. No, they go to the website. Oh, look, now, now the content's changed, right? Now it's about run for the oceans. Now it's about gear up, right? Explore running gear. Again, next best and there's some reporting, et cetera, which we can look at this live and, and that'll probably do us. Okay, that'll do us for now. Let's uh, hop back over here to the, oops, to the uh, agenda. So what we've just seen is an introduction, right? An end user experience from uh, end to end. Now let's actually get into the product, right? Because that was all screenshots. Let's actually get into some real uh, product here. So initial overview of foundations, web, sitemap, and so for this, I'm gonna actually use uh, some live uh, demo accounts. Okay. Now, the first thing you'll notice, so here I am on the Interaction Studio homepage, okay? The way you get here, for those who have never been here before, you might notice that in your accounts, Interaction Studio has got a little padlock on it. <laughs> Once you unlock it, you get access, you come in here and that's great. Um, up here at the top, these are the data sets. Yeah, they're not, ex well, they're kind of like business units. I guess there is a degree of separation here, but they're not explicitly tied to marketing cloud business units. So I think that, that is something worthwhile. You also notice Cloud Kettle. I did that on purpose and you'll see that in just a moment. Let's just introduce you to what's here on the left-hand side. Um, channels and campaigns. So when I said personalization is across any channel, that's what we're seeing, right? It is personalization on the web, on mobile, in email. Um, through triggered events. It is through server-side. Server-side refers to things like the CRM, service cloud, 
All right, remember Service Cloud Console, those next best actions, whatever. It could even be integrations into other uh, components as well. Um, audiences, there is a segmentation component to this. Now, hands up those of you who have worked in Marketing Cloud a long time and you've struggled to get web behavioral data into Marketing Cloud to do really easy personalized, like, sorry, to do really easy segments. Raise your hand. Of course you have, right? Because Marketing Cloud, you know, the data's all there, but natively there is not any kind of thing that's capturing all of that data. I know this, I remember this from 2015 and it was one of my gripes back then. And it was a gripe of mine until a few years back, but not anymore, right? This Interaction Studio, this Marketing Cloud personalization solves that completely. And I'll be diving into that uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit later. Other foundational elements on the left is the catalog. The catalog is important, all right? And I'll give you an example why. The catalog can be made up of, okay, if you're a retail customer, it's gonna be products. If, however, you're a company like Cloud Kettle, right, who published lots of blog posts, right, like a marketing cloud implementation partner, um, it might be blog posts. It could be articles. Maybe you are um, a publisher. Maybe you're Nine News, or maybe you're uh, the what are the other parent companies? Channel Channel Seven, One. You know, you know what I mean. Maybe you're those organisations, um, and you just publish articles. Right. Each of those can be represented by a catalog. This is by no means the place where you author them. I mean, it's important that we have a reflection of them. And I'll jump into those a bit later. Promotions are important as well. Promotions refer to types of content that aren't necessarily like a catalog. If you're a retailer, right? You know, you might have your products, of course, there could be 10,000, 100,000, a million of them, your SKUs, but your promotions, they're something else, right? You might only have three, five, seven of them at any, uh, live at any one time. And Interaction Shield wants to have a record of those. And I'll explain why later. Surveys, surveys are awesome, right? We're living in this age where first part out of zero part out is important. Surveys allow you the ability to give these little simple pop-ups on the website, right? Tell us a little something about you and just slowly progressively profile them. Machine learning is very important, right? I'll be talking about this a little bit later. There are two types, two types of machine learning here. Uh, one is to do with essentially AI, like recommendations of products. The other is to do with a different, <coughs> excuse me, um, Something to do with feature engineering, with design time decisions. Uh, and these are all settings and, and all the rest of them. Now, there's a lot there, okay? We don't have time to go into the ins and outs of every single one of them. So let's keep it really, really simple, all right? We're gonna start with web. And I'm gonna do that because eventually I'm gonna hand off to Josephine who's gonna go a little bit deeper. How do we personalize the website? All right, really simple place to start. It's a bit isolated from, from Marketing Cloud because it's totally web, but don't worry, we're going to bring it back. Let's actually start now live uh, with how do we actually do that on the website. All right. So this now is where we get into the live uh, component. So uh, over here under web, we've got different elements, different sort of things here. Uh, website configuration. Now I'm now going to attempt live uh, to personalize a part of Elliot Harper's company's website. I'm first going to add a new domain to make sure that this, yep, thank you. Uh, this is okay, all right? So that's good. What I'm then going to do next is jump over here to site-wide JavaScript. Now, there is a help page somewhere over here. Where are we? Somewhere here. No, yeah, all right? So well, I just want to call out that everything I'm about to do, it's all here, all right? There's code snippets and blah, 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 right? To get all this sort of code. But for the interest of time, I'm just going to jump in and grab a, a code snippet here, which is the most basic of the sitemap. Now, what is a sitemap? Essentially, the sitemap is uh, a bit of code that's gonna run right, once we add the Interaction Studio um, tag to the site. Has anyone ever used Google Tag Manager and added a tag to a website? Hands up. Yes, half of you have, right. Essentially, for those who haven't, essentially it's just adding a bit of code that we wanna run right, to do stuff. And I'll tell you about what that stuff is now. So let's actually do it now. I'm going to add this in here. This is just generic stuff. Most of it I don't have to worry about, but it's, it is generic. So let's actually change some of the stuff that's important. I'll make that cloudkettle.com. Uh, and well, that's not, that's not important. We, we want to get rid of that. And uh, the first page that I want to personalize, I'm going to call the homepage. All right. I'm going to basically work towards an example of me personalizing 
the homepage banner of cloudkettle.com. And these things here, I will leave. Now, for those of you who live and breathe this stuff, again, this is the first part of today's demonstration. I'll be spending about 10 minutes here. We'll go a bit deeper and then we'll get a bit further into the weeds. But for those who haven't seen this before, this will be absolutely fascinating to you, no doubt. All right, let's just hit save, that'll do. All right. Now, this is all good. I could muck around here, but there's actually a better tool that I can use to help configure this, all right? And over here, I have the Cloud Cutter website. Now, Elliot couldn't make it today, but he's gonna watch the recording with Glee because I'm going to use this Chrome extension here. This is the Salesforce, uh, what's it called now? It's, it's the Interactions SDK launcher, I think, Chrome extension, is that right? The point is, <laughs> I'm gonna give it an account, which is my, my account details, uh, and a data set, right? which is Cloud Kettle 2. And then I'm gonna inject the SDK. So basically, this is a Chrome extension, it's just, in, it's like appending a bit of JavaScript, right, to the site, right? And it's doing that so that I, I can just, for, for demonstration purposes, show you. Hands up if you're completely lost by that statement, and I'll explain it further because that was pretty high level. Yes, good. See this site? I can't show you how to personalize this site in like real life. If I really wanted to show you how to do that, I'd have to contact Cloud Kettle and go, hey, Cloud Kettle, can you add a bit of code to the site? And they're going to go F off. No, who are you? So I'm going to use my web browser just to pretend. That's basically what it is. So now that I've injected this SDK, I'm going to turn on this visual editor. And what that's going to do, it's going to refresh the page and it's going to give me these options in this kind of uh, beehive looking thing here on the bottom right. Now I can actually pretend, right, like I'm developing on the site. And let's do that right now. So site map, I'm going to go ahead and now I'm editing, the, I'm editing the sitemap, but now with a bit of a window into the website. Now, why am I doing this? Essentially, I'm trying to tell Interaction Studio, or Marketing Lab Personalization, hey, I want to be able to personalize this homepage. Let's step, let, let's step back. Why would I want to do that? Well, frankly, Cloud Kettle offer wonderful services to the sales cloud, for service cloud, for marketing cloud, for revenue ops, for like a bunch of other stuff. You know how they can increase their leads? By personalizing the homepage. If I've Googled Cloud Kettle Marketing Cloud, when I come to the site, give me what I want, personalize it. And change these words to say, we are your marketing cloud experts, trusted advisors, click here right now. Thank you, business, done. So that's what we're gonna do. All right, to do that, I'm now basically editing the sitemap, right? But in this sort of lovely, uh, extension here and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to basically say I want to personalize this content but how do I do that the way I do that is down here content zone interaction studio my kind of personalization is not responsible for completely changing the website and everything in the order of stuff or what. no 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 it's got a marketing lens on it all right that means we think about outcomes what are we trying to achieve right? we're trying to increase conversions I don't care about what else is on this site I care about the home page panel and the same goes for other you know, dedicated zones. But in this case, I want to basically specify this. So what is the selector? This is basically a CSS selector. I have no idea what it is. So I'm going to right mouse click and click inspect. And I'm going to find out what it is. And it turns out it's this thing. Right? This is the thing that I want to personalize. This is the zone of the site I want to take over. I want Marketing Cloud Personalization to take this over and make that decision of what to show so that I can achieve my marketing outcomes. And all I do is I right mouse click and I go copy, copy selector, done. And then I paste it in here. And then we're done. And I probably should give it a name. So we'll paste that in there and we'll give it a name. And the name of this content zone, I, I guess, is you know, Homepage Hero. And I could do this across any pages that I like. We'll just do one for now. We'll get rid of the other one. Keep it nice and simple. I'm going to hit execute. That will run it, refresh it. And yep, good. It's picked it up. We have a content zone called Homepage Hero. And I can keep doing this and so on. So basically, I've told Interaction Studio, this is the part of the website, right, to personalize. Okay. All right, that's done. Let's save and close. What's next? Next, 
Um, that's nice. Now I'm still got my developer hat on here. I'm configuring the sitemap and so on. And there's more work to do, right? We probably want to add more code so that when someone clicks on a, a blog post or a case study, we're recording that against the relevant catalog item and so on. That's out of scope for today. Uh, but let's actually talk about now, how do I create something that's going to personalize this? And the answer is templates and campaigns, All right? So for those of you who've never seen this before, thinking about marketing cloud, right? Emails. Hands up those of you who have done marketing cloud email campaigns and know all about creating emails. Good. What we're now going to do is essentially create a, like a template so that end users can then just take the template and then off they go. We're doing the exact same thing, just in a web environment. To do that, I'm going to click templates. Now, you know, marketing cloud, you go and create a template and there's always like out of the box ones. You can pick and choose and then just sort of edit them. We're doing the exact same thing. I'm going to go and create a template, not from scratch. I'm going to click view list and I'm going to go to my global templates. And there's a lot, right? And there's a lot of things here that like, what, what's Einstein concept recommendation? That looks interesting. What's this Google Analytics segment push, right? I don't know, they're out of scope for today. But if you're interested in them, later on today, we're going to do a, a survey and we're going to go, what do you want to learn more about? And you tell me, right, which of these? There's exit, in, remember that, that, that highlight that we stepped through, exit intents, right, pop up, there's one of those. There's all slide ins. There's, there's no shortage. I'm not interested in pop-ups and slide-ins. I want to organically personalize something. So I'm just going to choose this banner equal to action. All right. This is a template, and that is nice. Um, the template editor down here essentially controls not just where and you know how to do it, but also what tools does a marketer have on the left? See this stuff on the left? This is important. The developer is defining a template so that the marketer doesn't have to think about it. The marketer just gets these really easy fields that they can just fill in, right? And they can create their, essentially their, their campaign. And we can see here, there are things like a background image URL, a style, some header, subheader, call to action. And if I decide, you know what? Hey, Cloud Cloud have actually got two call to actions. They've got two buttons. How do I, how do I fix this? Well, this is how a developer goes in. You've got handlebars, CSS, client side and server side. All right, so from the handlebars perspective, you can see all the things here, right? The header, the subheader, the CTA text, the CTA URL. If I wanted to, I could simply copy and paste this, right? And we'll call it CTA URL 2, CTA text 2, CTA text 2. And that's nice, right? The template's going to have it, but then I need to do more. I have my CSS so I can style it and I have my client side code, which is, is fine. But the server side code here, this here essentially controls what it is that we're seeing here on left. The inputs that we're going to give to the marketers. So I need to make sure that I go ahead and I replicate everything I'm seeing here for that second CT, uh, for that second call to action, which I'm not going to do because that's going to take too long. So I'm just going to happily delete that and we'll go ahead and click uh, save and publish. So you can see there's all these rich ways that right that we can give or we can control this and we can see now that we've done that that's all good and well but i'm just going to um, unpublish that for a moment something i forgot to do was actually explicitly say this particular uh, template is for use in this content zone which i want to do that no unpublish thank you ah it's live thank you lovely we go home page hero lovely <laughs> And once I do that and I say that it is the homepage hero zone, immediately all this default stuff now kicks in, right? My background image of someone riding a bike, right? The header text, right? It's all there. And that's fine. Okay, we'll hit save. We hit publish. Yes. Okay. So from the developer's perspective, you're using these editor things, right, to create that template that the marketers can then use. So now let's take our hats off from developers and put our marketer hats on. The way that they're gonna go into the platform is actually from here, right? They're gonna go into the platform, they're gonna go here and they're gonna go web campaigns and they're gonna click new. And when they do that, they'll get that lovely interface. If the code's on the site, but this is a demo, right? I don't have the code on the Cloud Kettle site, so I'm just gonna keep going with this, uh, with this interface. So now as a marketer, I can go ahead and I can um, create my new campaign. And when I add my campaign, I've got my list of published templates. Which template am I basing this campaign on? Is it 
something from the homepage call to action. Yes, it is. All right, what do I want it to look like? And then I go ahead and I say, this is about uh, marketing cloud services. And we're going to say something like um, cloud kettle is the best. Ha ha. No, Elliot. We couldn't make it today. And so on, right? You get the idea. So what I'm building out here is this personalized homepage. And then that's all nice, right? These are all like the mechanics of it and that's fine. Who do I want to see this though? Elliot. We want Elliot to see it. We want Elliot's prospective customers to see it, right? How do we do that? There's a few ways, but one of them is here, I can add a rule and say, I only want these certain people to see it. And this is quite rich, right? And there'll be a whole section. So you can actually predefine an audience segment, which I'll get to a bit later about how we'd work that out. But there's so many different, right? Thermograph, by the way, this is this is actually pretty good, right? Thermographic, right? Company name industry, right? Based on IP lookups, if you know the IP addresses of your, you know, of your prospects and so on. Uh, but there's things, you know, like a user attribute, a geography or visit behavior. If someone has, you know, uh, 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 visited a certain number of times, has come at least twice, and has spent, um, this is very basic, I'm gonna go into this a bit deeper later, right? And has spent at least five minutes and on a certain page and, and, and so on and so on. So I can actually limit this to one. And this is a very manual way of doing things. Here is my campaign and this is who I want it to go to. For those of you who, are, who just you know do a lot of marketing cloud email campaigns, right? The concepts are familiar and that's okay, but it's not scalable, it's not scalable. And I'll touch on a little bit later how we make it scalable. Um, there's A-B testing and there's you know, a bunch of other stuff here that we can do. We can make different variances and so on. The, the, the list goes on, but just in the interest of time, I will probably, we'll just check back in the agenda. We've done a quick overview of foundations where I've just got to go on to the left menu, uh, but we've done a little bit of the, of the site map, a little bit of the campaigns and how that's done. We'll go a little bit deeper before we do, I would like now to hand over to Josephine from OSF Digital, who'll talk us through a little bit about website architecture, a little bit about data and privacy. And when she's finished, we'll open it up for some questions around these types of topics. Remember, we've got all this stuff yet to come. Oh yeah. And with that, I will hand over to Josephine. And how is the best way that I do that? Thank you so much, Chris. Um... That was great. I think you want to stop sharing your screen for me to be able to do so. Great. I've stopped sharing. We can now see the meeting. If you hit share screen, we should be able to see and we should be able to hear you loudly. Awesome. Let me know if there's any issues. And there we go. Can everyone hear Josephine? Everyone's nodding. Just uh, speak a bit loudly and we will be able can to hear you. Hear? Yes. Okay. Lovely. So yeah, my name is Josephine Helkvist. I'm a solution architect within Salesforce Marketing Cloud, as well as Interaction Studio. And today we're gonna to do a short deep dive into website and data architecture. Okay, let's start with site mapping. And this is probably my favorite topic. So um, one of the first points I wanna talk about is the importance of understanding the website architecture. The recommendation of doing thorough research of the website structure is vital for a successful implementation. And so is individualization of your approach depending on the use cases, data structure, and website architecture. And here are some important considerations that I wanna to touch on. Um, so probably the first thing that I do when I start my research is to check what language the website is built on. And a good indication here is if it's React, for example, and I'm sure you guys are aware, at least if you're a developer, maybe you have come across this and it is, it is a bit of a topic anyway, um, then you might need to reconsider your approach. So that's good to keep in mind. Then I also check how is the website populating product data and why this is important is because product data is something that is constantly updating and changing. Um, and you need to be aware of how do I access this product data? And if it's a multi-site implementation, does all websites use a similar data population structure? Because if it does, that can really help and simplify um, the site mapping structure that you will build. 
And I would also check if there is data layers and metadata used to populate information, because this is the best practice of using the data available for you on the website um, when you're building your sitemap. And I would talk to the clients, and sorry, I'm using that word because I work for an agency, but I would talk to the client's um, web development team, if they have one, um, to check what type of data layers that are currently in use. And what you can see here on the right-hand side of the screen is a bit of a code snippet. This is available on um, Evergage, aka Salesforce um, learning portal. And um, basically what this code does is it's utilizing, um, uh, depending on the domain name of your website. So let's say you have like a multi site implementation that you're doing, um, you can use this code um, to then generate and only use like one sitemap. Um, but for all of the um, different websites that you have. So I thought that would be good to touch on. Okay, and then I also want to talk about um, data and website architecture. So the client's data architecture goes hand in hand with the architecture of the website. And it's important to understand how it's connected before planning and implementation. So the graph here to the right, um, where we kind of like mapped out here is how to look at the website structure and the data to um, know what type of um, data set structure that you're going to have. So you can have multiple data sets, but you can also have one data set. And this really depends on the data that you have in your system, as well as how like your websites are structured also. So the first question that you want to ask yourself, do you have several domains? And if you do, then you can check, um, will you have the same audience across those websites? And then you also want to check, um, are the domains similar in structure? And depending on the outcome, might be a multiple um, data set implementation, or it might be one data set. And also, if you only have a single domain, um, you probably want to check if they support multiple regions, um, so different like locations and so on and also if the stock is same across those regions. And depending on the answers to those questions, you might have one data set and you might have multiple data sets. And why I'm bringing this up is because as a solution architect, what we do, we look at these type of structures to know, is this implementation gonna take longer time or is it gonna take shorter time? And how are we gonna be planning the architectural structure of um, the interface itself, as well as the website and like the sitemap component. And a tip here, is you can use a dynamic sitemap for um, small inconsistencies. So even if you would have, okay, you, you have your domains, um, if it's a multi-site implementation, and you notice that, okay, my domains are very similar in structure, but they aren't identical, that's okay. Um, you can still use one sitemap, just like create certain parts of it um, dynamic, if that makes sense to everyone. Okay, and finally, how do we handle privacy? So I'm sure that most of us are across the GDPR, which is um, very strict policy about um, data gathering in Europe. Um, Australian websites need to adhere to this. And this is really important because even if you're selling products, for example, in Australia only, if there's a customer from Europe that enters your website, um, and you're collecting data without their consent, um, that's a breach. So Interaction Studio needs to adhere to all privacy considerations, including the GDPR. But what you can do is that you can apply a script in the sitemap to handle this, where you check if the person has consented to cookies or not. Um, and what you can see on the screen here is on the left-hand side, um, usually we make sure that the client would have already developed like a pop-up, of um, just like a front end type of um, cookie consent part. And then the script to the right, I developed for one of the um, interaction implementations I did um, earlier last year. And what this script does is it checks for if you have accepted um, the cookies or not. And if you have, then we will initiate the sitemap, start tracking. And if not, then, well, we're not gonna be tracking you. And that's all for me for right now. And I'll come back later. Thank you. Thanks, Josephine. Before I continue, we'll pause now and just open up for any questions. 
Any questions on what we've seen so far or particularly to do with the sitemap and setup? Yes, we have one in the room. Go ahead. So the question was, how long does it take to do an implementation of personalization? Yeah. I will open that up to those who have done it. Uh, go ahead, Josephine, would you like to answer that? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say like in general speaking terms, um, anything between like 11 to 13 weeks, but it depends on the use cases. Um, if you have like quite a few use cases, it might be a little bit longer. If it's more of a simpler implementation, yeah, then you're looking for like a shorter timeline as well. But in general, we would say between 11 to 13 weeks. Any other questions in the room or online? We have a couple of questions online, but let's go around the room first. Yep. Anyone else in the room? Otherwise, we'll go online. No? Online it is. I love this question. Any? Specific required prerequisites for understanding Interaction Studio. What do you need to know first from a dev point of view? From a dev point of view, what is good to know? Or what do you need to know before you start working with Interaction Studio? Hmm. Is JavaScript an answer? I don't know. Josephine or anyone else in the room would like to answer that. What are some prerequisites? If you if you've spent your world in Salesforce Marketing Cloud, predominantly emails, journeys, mobile, that sort of thing, and you're about to undertake personalization, Interaction Studio on, what are some things you can do to upskill yourself? JavaScript will help you massively. Thanks, Nick. Anyone else? And a bit of jQuery might be helpful. No? Anyone else? All right, there you go, from a web perspective. Yes, web languages. Good call. Chrome browser. A browser, sorry? Chrome. Oh, Chrome browser. Oh, yeah. Chrome tools. I think you need to understand the DOM. You need to understand the CSS. The DOM, yes. Yeah. Good call. Uh, here's another question we've got online. In IS certification, JavaScript and frameworks. Is there a certification for Interaction Studio yet? Hmm. Good question. From a partner perspective, I don't know the answer. There might be one. There is, there is, one. There is one. There is. Thank you. Um, yes, there's the certification. Um, I don't know if anyone can access it, but I know that, like, I have a certification in Interaction Studio, for example, and there's actually two parts to it now. So there's one more like general speaking terms, um, and there's also one like more technical. Okay, so there's two. Good to know. So from a technical perspective, reach out to your Salesforce account partner if you are from a, a, a partner uh, about how to get that. Another question we've got here is what should be rough web traffic to implement IS? So for example, if a website only has a thousand to two thousand, I guess that's clicks or unique visits per day, is it worth it? I'm going to answer that. It just depends on the use case. It depends on what you want to achieve. And the outcome of a conversion. If you only get 1,000 visitors a day, but, but when a conversion happens, it's worth tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. But if, you, if one conversion is $10, hmm. um, I, I love this question that we had. Um, how do we implement Interaction Studio for the Salesforce Marketing Cloud Developers Group? How do you mean? What's how, how, do we, how do we set it up for ourselves? <laughs> That's one of the questions. How do we set it up for ourselves? Yeah. To do what? I don't know. To find out more about our members. I, I guess. I guess. Do on the website? Yeah. To sort of learn more about our membership. The, the question was how do we set it up for ourselves? How do we set it up on the Marketing Cloud Developers Group to learn more about ourselves? You know how we do it? We first don't do it. First, we understand what are we trying to achieve? Why are we trying to achieve it? And is the website set up in such a way where it can allow uh, for that? So we do our homework first. 
is the first thing I would say and understand what it is we're trying to achieve and, and we do a bit of uh, yeah, a bit of planning there first. Uh, another question. I'm just reading these questions out. <laughs> 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 uh, can Interaction Studio be integrated with iOS app, Android app? I'm not going to answer that. I'll leave that with you. Short answer, yes. There are mobile SDKs available, so yes. Any more answers in there online people? Please, oh, questions, sorry, not answers. Chris has got the answers. He says, just to... No, I think we've got to the end of it. All right, good. We're right on time. It's 7.30, we're about halfway through, which brings us to the next part of tonight's overview. So now what I'm going to do is dive into all of these things, and we'll spend quite a bit of time going into each of these things if there are questions in the room or online, feel free to jump out, feel free to shout out. If we're going down too much a rabbit hole, I will rein them in. Uh, but please, I, I welcome these types of questions. What I'd really love to do is give an overview of all of these different foundational elements of marketing cloud personalization, right? of Interaction Studio. Now, some of them I'll go a little bit deep, a little bit. Some of them I won't go deep at all. And again, that's because we just don't have time. Right? We just don't have time. But what I want you to do is make a note of the things that interest you because at the end of tonight, there's going to be a survey and I want you to put in, Chris, I'm talking to you, what interests you, what you want to learn more about. All right, let's get started. So this is all about the how, like that whole journey that I showed you about Rachel Morrison, it was like cross-channel, real-time personalization across any channel, blah, blah, blah. How did all of that happen? How do we do real-time personalization? How does it work with marketing cloud, your emails? Etc. So let's get into it. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Just realize that online can't see what I'm doing. <clears throat> All right. Online should be able to see what I'm doing right now. Okay. Where to begin? We'll do a couple of things here. Um, the first is the catalog. We need to start with the foundations, right? The catalog. Now, I've got two accounts that I will uh, sort of jump and sort of bounce between. One of them I will actually just log into, uh, which I should have done earlier, but I'm gonna bounce between retail and the opposite the opposite of retail, right? Cloud Kettle. And I think it's important because it's, it just sort of speaks to the, to the, the, the strengths of that. It really isn't all about uh, one industry or the other. It really doesn't matter. When we talk about the catalog, Interaction Studio here has a knowledge and understanding of the catalog. Right? If you are in, it doesn't matter what industry you are, essentially the essence, your, your catalog items, whether they are blog posts, whether they're products, whether they're articles, right? If you're a news publisher, it's going to be articles, right? If you're a retail, it's going to be products. That product catalog needs to be fed into Interaction Studio. And it needs to be fed in, in a meaningful way. And what I mean by that is not just, you know, the, the basic attributes, right? So here's an example of some blog posts, some Cloud Kettle, we see here some basic attributes, right? The name, the URL, the image, the description, maybe some ratings. These are just simple attributes, yes, but they don't really give us much business context here. This here is where the, 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 the juicy stuff lies. These are the related catalog attributes. These are kind of like the one to many, right? But these are the different things that are gonna be driving the affinities of the customer. So as the customer is interacting with the blog post, right, what are their affinities towards advisory, towards Salesforce orgs, towards you know, whatever it might be. In a retail context, I'll just jump over here, um, similar to the Rachel Morris example, right, as they're interacting with the Roverito running shoe, right, that's going to tell us things. They're not interested in hiking boots for men. They're interested in right, the, the running shoes for women. We can do things from that, just from that browsing data. And that's really, really important. And so bringing in that catalog is key. It's a kind of thing that can be done in two ways. Typically customers will uh, generate like a, a regular batch upload, uh, which is pretty straightforward. If any of you ever done the, the, the marketing cloud, um, Einstein Rex, for example, that, that should be pretty familiar to you. It's very similar. However, there's also the ability in the sitemap to actually create an update these catalog records um, in real time, which is also pretty cool. So let's have a look here. We've got some uh, products. This is an example, right? If we bring up that, uh, what was it? The Roverito running shoe, for example, right? There it is. 
right? We've got the image, etc. And there's features, there's agenda, there's a style, there's brand, etc. So having all that information is key because regardless of whether it's a product or a blog post or an article, as users are interacting with it, if they click on an email with it, if a service cloud agent happens to send them something and engage, it doesn't matter. These are the types of, th these things here are ultimately what drives those affinities. And that's really important. We'll see why in a minute. So we end up with these rich customer records, right? These rich, right? we go to all users here and I'll, uh, I'll type my name, my name in here, Chris. Maybe, right, I'm somewhere here. This person got something? No, maybe. Who's this person? Let's let's have a look. All right. Just picked up some random person in Arizona, I guess. Um, here I can see by the views, right, just by the click behavior that they have a strong affinity towards waterproof insulated footwear, right? But not just footwear, jackets too. I can see um, that brand, that brand's interesting, right? Because oftentimes they have a site that, that may stock many brands. Uh, but the key thing is each of these affinities completely customizable. They're completely configurable. You can relabel them to whatever you like. There's a total of eight or nine, I think, different ones here that you can do. All right, so we've got the catalog and that's nice, right? When we go ahead and we configure the catalog, for example, I'll just jump it back over to here. We've got the catalog. Each of these things are configurable, as I said. And in fact, I actually prepared this Cloud Kettle one tonight. I went over here and I said, yes, my blog post is going to be made up uh, and it's going to have an, an item class and solutions and author and, and all the rest of it. So all that's very, very configurable. It's important to set that up as part of the foundation. So that's our catalog. Now, let's talk about segmentation. What can we do with this stuff? Because that's important. Now, again, raise your hands in the room. If you've been working in marketing cloud data extensions and you wish you had some web behavioral data to enrich the way you're doing segments, raise your hand. Who's missing that? Yes, James, I know you are. You've been asking it for years. Well, it's now here, right? Because obviously there is a tag on the website, right? It's tracking all this stuff. And of course, as you'd expect, it's all there. Now, if we jump over here to the segments, now, Action Studio is going to allow for you as implementation partners, as customers, as marketers, whatever it is, to create segments. There's some out of the box ones that come, they're, they're pretty basic. But let's go ahead and jump into the segmentation builder. The segmentation builder will out of the box leverage all of this rich data that's collecting from your SDKs, not just from the website, but also from the mobile app too, right? And also from external data being fed in. That includes, by the way, in-store purchase data. If you are a retailer, right? The same mechanism that, that stores the purchase will also feed in in-store data. But let's have a look. In our dropdown, we have so much rich features available, so many rich features available. We have things like uh, campaigns, right? Where we can measure based on different campaigns, things that were set up, the, the stack count, the recently, or even a particular test segment they've been involved in. Visitation, that's a like bog standard one, and I will just spend a bit of time on this because it's been sorely missed, but it's here now for all of you folk now. We have the ability to segment based on the visit count. How many times right, has a customer been to the site for all time or maybe today in the last X days, more than X days ago, on a between and, and, and so on, right? Really rich segmentation features there. Maybe it's about duration. How much time have they spent right, on our site? And that's really important too. Right? Because you want to maybe not target those that have spent like 30 seconds, right? They've got to spend at least X amount of minutes. Duration, recency, how long ago did they visit? We've got source, right? Visited source. There's different source acquisitions you can configure in the sitemap. So you record all that stuff. Time since first visit. We've got originating referrer, which also out of the box things, right? So you think about all the UTM parameters and stuff that you're capturing, right? That's all now available. So we can capture or create these segments based on the referral URL, where they've come from. Maybe they've come from an affiliate site, right? The medium, the source name, the source, all the standard UTM stuff, right? It's all here, right? all available to create these rich segments. Search terms is a favorite one, right? Just think about now all the money that's spent on Google Ads. So you should be talking, for those of you partners or even customers, like think about all the money that's spent on Google, on Bing, et cetera. Right? And what are you doing when they land on the site? Are you always funneling them down some campaign landing page? How much effort does that take? Right? You've now got the ability to create these segments and therefore personalize that initial experience based on search terms they're entering. 
All right, that's visits. It's pretty rich. And obviously, you know, this is a pretty no brainer one, right? Are they anonymous? Yes or no? Right? Have they authenticated or have they subscribed or whatever? Right? Yes or no? That's a pretty basic one, but it's all there now. Um, there's things like actions. Now, actions are completely customizable, right? They can be what, like, honestly, they can be whatever you like, right? An action could be uh, that they signed up, that they downloaded this, that they clicked the contact us form, that they added to cart and didn't finish, whatever it is, but that's all available. Basically, custom actions, you define them, right? In your sitemap, in your SDK, whatever it is, and you can do lots of stuff. Have I done, is it this account? Did a specific action. Did I populate this? Yes, no, a different site over here. I've got two accounts here going. We'll, we'll jump over here. So in the sake of Cloud Kettle, right, we might want to do an action and target those with a count or page view or recency or time since, so lots of different options. And those who did or did not do, uh, we'll say did um, a specific action being that they clicked an email. If you're busy working away inside of Marketing Cloud or any platform, frankly, and you're adding those URL parameters, right, to all the email, you know, click URLs, get the sitemap to pick them up and fire off an action if they click an email. Maybe in the case of Cloud Kettle, I noticed they've got a special button called uh, Speak to a, a, a Cloud Consultant. And I want to capture that. I want to capture If they've clicked on that button, but they didn't actually fill out the form, maybe I want to target them so that the next time they visit the site, well, they're anonymous, right? The next time they visit the site, I want to personalize. And I want to say, resume where you left off. Lots of, oh, this is a great one. Viewed careers pages. Why is that important? Someone tell me, why is this important to track if someone has visited the careers page of your website? Exactly. And do you want to be trying to sell to them? No. no. They're a prospective employee. They're probably not interested in, you know, like why waste? Don't, don't waste your effort, right? This is a, this is a good one. All right, so you could actually create a segment here of prospective uh, applicants, let's say, right? And if they visited that page and, you know what, let's go one step further, not just that they've done that, maybe, um, you know, in the last X days or they've spent a certain amount of time and so on, right? Maybe they accidentally clicked on, you wanna make sure you capture that, right? But that's a great one, right? You wanna make sure you exclude prospective employees. How many certs, good one, why not? Let's record that as an action and do exactly that. What else have we got here? Location. Now this is all based on um, IP address, right? So the IP address of the device is picked up, whether it's app or whether it's web. And then based on that, there is a kind of a lookup that you would have seen some of those profiles that picked up like general areas. It's not exact, right? It's IP address. So my, I, I live in one suburb and, and according to my IP address lookup, I it thinks I'm like five Ks away, right? So it's, it's an approximation and that's something to, to keep in mind. But company and industry is interesting. This actually allows uh, B2B customers to upload, right? Uh, essentially, like, imagine like a spreadsheet, right? These are the IP addresses and these are the companies that we know use them. So we can identify when someone is visiting right, from a company. So think about that. Hand, right, hands up if you are from a B2B customer or you are a partner who does work with B2B customers. Raise your hands. All right, so I want you to be thinking about that. And the, the, the stories here are, how do you, pers again, the, the title of Bobby here, how do we personalize in real time? Imagine now you happen to capture the B2B customer, the B2B customer, their end user, that you've captured um, someone's details and that's nice, but their role is mid-level manager. And now all of a sudden you've got someone else on the site and based on the fact you know they're from the same company, you know they're from the same company, you already got their details. Hey, the IP address is the same. We know they're from financial services. We know they're from this industry, this company. How would you change the experience on the site based on that? All right, this is gonna allow you to do that. All right, metrics. Metrics are interesting. KPI, attributes and so on. So this actually allows you to create your own metrics, your own fields, right? Your own aggregate values, which is nice, but this one's pretty important. Engagement is an engagement score system inside of this. And it's actually down here. Settings. Over time. Uh, engagement. Out of the box, there comes this engagement score. So think about how you might use this. Right? This essentially is a configurable engagement score. You can specify the typical maximum number of days between expected activity. Like when would you expect your customers to, there's a bit of change industry to industry, right? 
if you're in an industry, maybe it's um, property, right? It's a long tail or cars, right? Long tail, whereas other things are very short. You can adjust this between the expected things. This will adjust the model. But then the weighting and configuration is also, so right now out of the box, it's purely based off web, web visits. The more you visit, if I visited the website 10 times in a week, my engagement score is going to be 100%, right? But I can configure it to say, perhaps I want to have it triggered by certain actions. Like for example, if I happen to click on the speak with a consultant, or if this is a cloud kettle, if I click on the button that says, I want to call Eddie, Elliot Harper right now because I need his help, I'm going to make the engagement score super duper high, right? That's going to have a high uh, weighting. And then I might add another action and so on. And you can configure that with KPIs or even segments. You can actually go ahead back and build your own segments and go, if someone falls into this segment, that's a super high, you know, like they're, they're very engaged. We want to do something and get that to be a big weighting to the engagement score. And again, these engagement scores can even be used back in the segment builder. All right. One last thing here I've got to mention on this segments. Um, yeah, yeah. I just heard a question. Can we use this as lead scoring? Yes, you can. The answer is yes, you can. The more interesting question is how does it work with part of, but well, that's for another day. But yes, you can. And we have customers today who will take that data. And by the way, everything you're seeing here, the profile record can synchronize directly with a Salesforce lead or contact record. So think about a Salesforce lead record all of a sudden having a lovely engagement score, right? Think about sales reps who look at leads records and CRM, and now they can sort those lead records by engagement score so they know which ones are important. Yes, it's possible. That's a deep area. It's a deep area. Well, if you're interested in that, that'll be on the survey. So we'll, we'll go deep in that in, in another session. Um, before I finish off and, and show you what, what's awesome, that, that there's going to be a magic button that's going to appear over here in a moment. I need to just focus one last thing on the segmentation items. Okay, do we remember, let's jump back over here, right? Let's have a look at this person. Look at their, as a terrible example of a person, uh, they have nothing. Uh, let's jump on, I don't know, this, this dummy person that I was mucking around with before. Ah, this is my bot. They'll have lots of stuff. So, Let's think you're Elliot Harper and <laughs> you want to tag, you want to try and find people who are interested in Salesforce service club. No, he wouldn't do that. No, who are interested in email marketing uh, and advisory and are interested in Salesforce marketing cloud and uh, where the author is Elliot, right? And, and, and so on, right? All these different things, right? Because again, all these affinities are there. They're great. They're going to be used in two ways. The first is the primitive way. It's the way of today, but I want you all thinking of the future. So let me show you the way of today. How do I create a segment of these people who want to speak to Elliot? The way I do that is I jump over to my segments. And when I create my segment, I get this new feature thing here called items. When I click on items, I get the ability to create a segment based on that affinity here. So I can do a segment based on the first time they did something, the amount of times, the time spent, etc. There's some commerce related ones. I'll do time spent. And I want to target those who view not any, but a specific blog post. Maybe if I'm that target, I might actually just search for a very specific blog post that Elliot wrote, right? And it was one about uh, how to build multilingual dynamic email campaigns. <laughs> Great. All right. I want to target those who have viewed that at least or have spent at least two minutes reading it, et cetera, et cetera. This is my segment just based off web behavior. That's nice. It's a bit specific. And it doesn't scale, but that's why we have those related catalog objects, right? So what we're going to do is not target based on a blog post. We're going to pick one of those things in the affinity wheel. And so what I really care about is the solutions, which happens to be one of those things. So the solutions in this case, uh, ignore the word style there, I've re-enabled it, but I want to target those in the marketing cloud, right? I don't care about a specific catalog record. I care about that it was with marketing cloud and so any article right i want to target those people who spent at least two minutes in the last seven days looking at any article that was with marketing cloud whether it was authored by elliot or not and just like that and oh and by the way uh you know that's nice but what happens if they're already an existing customer probably want to exclude them right so we want to we want to continue to build right additional rules and so on and so forth right um, but you get the point so we'll go ahead and call this and we'll call this um elliot prospects because he is looking after that. 
That's not true. I just made that up. But once that's saved, we get a few cool things here. We get a list of all the users that belong to that segment. We get, a we get information on the trends. How are users going in and out of these segments uh, over time, which is interesting. How does it compare to other segments? Right, so it's actually out of the box segment comparison tool, which is really powerful, affinities and so on. But this is, and it's not appearing here, I'll just go back and reload it. What do I do with this segment, right? There's my Elliott Prospect. What, what do I do with this? There's lots of things that we can do with this, right? Number one, number one, um, I can go up here into my web campaign. And do you remember how when I, was, I created that fake web campaign and I had an ability to add rules? I can add a rule and say, I want to limit it to just these people who fall into the segment. And bang, just like that, right? In real time, if someone spends two minutes on an, on an article or a blog post or on Cloud Kettle that is to do with marketing cloud because it's been tagged up that way, the next time they hit that particular content zone, they're going to get a personalized experience. So that's great. But it could be other channels. It could be mobile, it could be email, it could be server side, etc. Well, you know what else it could be? It could be the moment someone falls into that, I want to trigger them on a journey in marketing cloud, right? That's what we want. And that's what this thing does, right? Sync to other systems, add to journey builder thing here. So we have the ability now, not now, for ages now, the moment that someone joins this segment, we can go ahead and create a journey over here in journey builder, which I'm not going to do because you're all familiar with. And the way that works is the moment someone hits something, it hits an API event, it's going to add them to a data extension, uh, and off they go, right? You use a data extension entry source, right? And, and, and so on, right? And they're entered in on that journey. Lots and lots of different options there. So that is a quick overview of all the different ways that we can apply segmentation. Now that's nice, but now what I want you to do is think about scale, right? Segmentation, that's great. But I just created a segment for people interested in marketing cloud, and then I've got to go ahead and decide what content I want to show them uh, and what things and, and recommend all the rest of it. Now, um, I've got to then repeat that for every single possible segment. That is unscalable, right? And that's where we want to introduce machine learning, right? which is really where, which is where the recipes and other elements are going to come in. So segments are all good and well, right? And they're a great starting place. But you need to be thinking about how do you optimize, right? Not just the, like in terms of the platform, but resources, right? Because businesses today, they don't have all the budget in the world to be going out and hiring people. So how do we, how do, we do this? So there's a number of ways. Over on the left here, under machine learning, there's a couple, right? Einstein recipes, Einstein decisions. In a nutshell, recipes, think of recipes as when you've got thousands of SKUs or thousands or hundreds of blog posts or lots and lots of articles. And you need some machine learning that's going to work out what is product recommendations or article, like article recommendations. For anyone who's ever worked, again, hands up, those who have worked with the marketing cloud, Einstein recommendations or email recommendations, web recommendations, and show of hands. All right, so you're, you're familiar with this concept, all right? Uh, but this is much better. And let me show you why. There's two types. I'm going to show you this, this skew level stuff, and then we'll talk about stuff that's not where you've got a thousand of them. All right, recommended. Okay, so recipes. How do we how do we go about doing this? So Interaction Studio, Marketing Guide Personalization, right, allows you to create a recipe. This is essentially creating your own machine learning recommendation thing. It's not a black box, box. we call it a white box because marketers can influence it. All right, and it's very different to the old, to the systems of old. What we're creating here is a recommendation system that is completely channel agnostic. Notice how this recommendation, can we say all acknowledge it? This is not email. Notice how the word email rex and web rex does not appear here. Okay, that's important. A recommendation should be agnostic of the channel. Pause for dramatic effect, right? Let's actually go ahead and create a new one, right? Let's go new and let's go ahead. So, so what have we got here? We'll give it a new one. We'll call it uh, recommended uh, blog posts type. All right, now we start off by adding uh, an ingredient. An ingredient can be lots of different things. Some of these might look familiar to you, uh, to some of you who have worked with these types of things. 
co-buy, right? Things were bought, people who have bought this have also bought that. Same with browse. Uh, there's smart bundling, right? These, these pants go with this shirt, that kind of thing. At trending products, right? That's a, that's a no-brainer. Similar items, we saw that at the very, very beginning when we're looking at this shoe. Hey, these are similar items, that's nice. Uh, most recently published, soon to expire. There's, there's a whole lot here. The collaborative filtering one, though, is one I'm gonna choose. It uses an algorithm that is, um, it, it really leverages that affinity wheel. Right? I won't say what it's like for fear of uh, repercussions, but basically what this is like is it uses that affinity wheel. And you, sir, what is your name? Yeah. Yeah. You are interested in running and you're interested in waterproof shoes. Great. What did you go on to, to, to look at a lot of? What did you go on to purchase? Okay, you went on to purchase that. That's nice. Um, and you, what is your name? Tash. Tash. All of a sudden now, your behavior by email or in the app or on web or whatever, you look a lot like this person. You look a lot like Jan. And we know that Jan ended up buying this. All right, all right, let's use that, all right? So that's that's the, that's the kind of feel for the type of AI that we're using here, so, right? Um, and we can specify various parameters, how far to look back and so on. Now, there are additional factors here that are really important when it comes to recipes because it, this is really a differentiator, right? For those who are familiar with the email recs and web recs and so on. We have marketers have the ability to additionally tweak it. This is so important. The other day I was talking to a customer who was working with AWS Personalize and the developer was like, this is amazing. It's cool, all these cool things. And the marketer was like, this is shit because I can't configure anything. And I have to go and always ask IT to do stuff. So exclusions. I have the ability here in this recommendation engine to put exclusions on a specific product. How good is that? Why is that good? Can someone tell me why this would be good? Why would we want to exclude a very specific product from a recommendation? Yes. Out of stock. Out of stock, thank you. Or there's a problem with the supplier or whatever. But maybe it's beyond just a specific SKU. Maybe it's the whole supplier. So maybe we might want to broaden it to a particular category or department and so on. Or whether the purchaser, let's exclude products the customers purchase, duh, right? Or perhaps products in a price range. Maybe this recommendation is for those who are uh, luxury customers or the other end of the spectrum, right? So we can put these additional limits on them. Things based on an inventory count or viewed or favor recommended. There are so many options here. It's not perfect, but there are a lot of different ways that we can tweak, right? We can see them all here, right? Let's limit it to products. In the case of Elliot's thing, we might want to say, well, I only want to recommend, and by the way, what are we recommending? I forgot to mention this. Are we recommending products? Is this a retail customer? Or is this a B2B customer recommending blog posts or articles or a publisher or whatever? If I'm recommending blog posts, maybe Elliot has published a million and one blog posts, right? Maybe he has, maybe he hasn't. And uh, he might want to uh, exclude certain blog posts, right? Based on a particular user attribute. Right? based on when we first saw them. There's no end, right? There's no end to various things here. Uh, boosters. Now, boosters are good. Why would, think about it from a retailer's perspective, why would a retailer want to boost certain products with a particular category or department? Why would they want to boost those and get them more featured in a recommendations engine? Yes. Overstock. Perfect. Exactly. Variations. There's a couple of different algorithms here. Variations. Variations is like, yeah, okay, we've got, we've got all these things now that's fueling our recommendations, but let's add some variation. Why would a retailer, as an example, want to add some spice, some variation? Sorry? Say it again? Sell more? How? What is this about? Not buying for themselves? Yes, exactly. Discovery. Discovery. I didn't know. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. Okay. These products are similar. These are what other things like. Oh, I didn't know you also sell chairs. I need a chair for my kitchen. Right? Lots of ways that we can influence these recommendations. Now, once it's done, we train it. We can then look at some previews. I'm, I'm not going to do that because we kind of saw that a little bit, right? Where we can actually hit train and view a sample group and we can actually like test. We can preview. What would it look like for this person and that person? And we, we saw a little bit of that at the start. 
So that brings us to the end of recipes. Now we've done recipes, that's nice, but then what? We've got our recipe, what do we do with it? All right, and that's up here in the top left. What we wanna do then is apply that recipe to any of these channels, any of these channels. We can apply it to web, sure. Oh, I'm not gonna show that, it's pretty rudimentary. It's kind of the same thing I showed before, but instead of showing a personalized homepage banner, you're just showing a uh, web content recommendation block, right? And you're just applying the recipe and it's gonna recommend those products. That's basic, if you wanna see more of that, again, in the survey, please write that in there. Um, but let's actually show something else. Let's show something that ties into marketing cloud, email. So what we wanna do now is talk about, you've got these visitors on the site, how do we personalize the email based on that? And I'm gonna just throw it out there. Again, those, there's quite a few people in the room who have experience with the old IGO digital email recs and web recs, right? And you're like, yeah, yeah, we could put the tag on the site and it could do this sort of. Not everything, not everything. Let's jump over to email. When we go to email, we have the ability to create two things. Number one is a template. Number one is a, a campaign, open time, open time campaign. This is kind of similar to those of you who are familiar with creating emails inside of Marketing Cloud, like you've got your template and then you, you create things. It's sort of similar, but we're not actually authoring the whole email here. All we're doing is authoring uh, a bit of content. It's gonna be powered by this real-time personalization engine. And so there are things like templates and the template is fairly rudimentary, right? Like what, what is a template? Um, what's the width? What's the height? What elements do we wanna show? And I'm using Cloud Kettle and we can see here, we've got, we wanna show the, um, the actual uh, item being the, the, the catalog item, whether it's a blog post or product or article, whatever. We wanna show the name, we wanna call to action and we wanna image URL, right? Some basic uh, muscle, uh, uh, handlebar sort of syntax there and that's all fine. And then once we've done that, we want to actually then create a campaign. And the campaign we want to create is then going to use that. So the first thing it says is, right, creating this campaign is just a bit of content. What is it about? Are we recommending solutions, item classes, or these different dimensions? No, we're, we're recommending blog posts, and that's great. What template are we using? Ah, we're using this one. And this one has this layout, right? Recommend yeah, blog post one, blog post two, and that's nice. And we can edit this, how many items you want to show, we can configure that. Um, what's powering it? You see, the recipe is channel agnostic. This is where we actually apply it. This is the recipe that I'm going to use. And there's all kinds of wonderful additions here, right? So just, just for the record, for those of you who are familiar with Einstein Rex, right? This is an additional level of customization that we can apply. Once that's done, right, you give it a name, right you hit save you hit simulate uh, et etc cetera, etc cetera. and you can then simulate and see what this is going to look like uh, against different users right um the, the, this what it looks like for that user that's what it looks like for that user right these different recommendations now are being applied in this way so you can really see marketing our personalization is a great abstraction from the concept of the thing of the machine learning to the actual channel but again for the people who have been here for, for three years or more who gives a shit we could do this kind of with Einstein Rex? Well, let me tell you why you should care. Because this is just recommendations. But that's at like a product level or an article level or like a specific SKU level. Now let me introduce the second element of machine learning, which is Einstein decisions. All right, what the hell is the difference? Einstein recipes are when you have lots of things. Right, you have lots of things like a product or blog post or whatever, but promotions, uh, outside decisions is for the things that you have fewer of. Now, in a classical sense, these may relate to things like promotions. So we'll pick, a, we'll come to Cloud Kettle, we'll pick a retailer. Uh, any given retailer is only gonna have X number of, a handful of promotions going on at any one time. Yeah? They're not gonna have a thousand, they're gonna have only a handful. So the question then becomes, when a user comes to my site, whether it's the homepage or whether the click through from a Facebook or Insta campaign, what is the best thing that I should be showing them? I mean, I've got all these different campaigns and maybe I've got like, it's the same campaign, like it's X percent off or whatever it is, but I've got two or three different creatives I could show. What do I show? How do I make sure that I'm gonna get the best outcome here? That's where machine learning comes. You see, if I don't use machine learning, then I'm stuck using segments. 
right? I'm stuck using segments going, let's target those people who clicked on this Insta campaign. By the way, we've got 20. Who clicked on this Insta campaign, they land on the site, and from their previous behavior, we'll create a segment of those people interested in dresses, and then we're gonna show them this content. Great. That took me an hour, and now I've got to repeat it 20 times. That doesn't scale, right? Instead, we want to use machine learning. So what that means is you create the assets, you create the things, the promotions, whatever. In the case of Cloud Kettle, it's actually not promotions. If you look here, I've got my generic homepage, and then I've, which is, I've just hacked it. It's just an image, right? And then I've got one that's tailored to Service Cloud, and I've got uh, one tailored to Marketing Cloud, and I've got another one tailored to Marketing Cloud with a silly call to action that says, we know everything, there is no that Marketing Cloud. Uh, and then I've got some other ones, right, that are based on next best action, right, and so on. The point is, this isn't about products, it's not about articles, it's about a promotion, a next best offer, a next best action. Right? What is the thing that you want the customer to do to achieve that marketing outcome? Now, when I've done it, if you look here, uh, I open this up. This is my promotion. It looks a bit different to a catalog record. Okay, we have a name URL, but we have validity, eligibility, right? The validity, is it valid? What are the start and end dates? That's important. Right? We have customers today who use, for example, Commerce Cloud, right? And they will export their promotions, that's where they author them, into here, we'll ingest it, and it's all there. But let's go further. Um, eligibility, do we want to limit this promotion to specific users? Right? Do we want to attribute and say, well, let's only make sure, right, that a customer has to have uh, this particular attribute, which I have terrible ones of here, and it has to be this, right? Or we might have a segment. We might have a promotion that's all about Elliot Harper's wonderful million and one blog posts. And we want to make sure that Salesforce Sales Cloud people aren't seeing those. So if this is a promotion or a uh, bit of personalized content, right? Just for Elliot, we want to make sure that we include people only in the Elliot Harper uh, segment, which isn't appearing here because I haven't refreshed. So let's pretend that is the Elliot segment that I created earlier. Lastly, and again, we might ignore all this, but look, see these things here? What are these things? Can anyone tell me what are these things? Where have we seen these before? Say it again. Yes, thank you. The affinity wheel. We have seen these things in the affinity wheel. We can add those same things that belong to our blog posts, our articles, our whatever, we can add them to our promotions. Right? Now the wheels start, now the wheels start turning. Imagine now a user who's been interacting with blog posts that are only about marketing cloud and security. Right? Now all of a sudden we can leverage machine learning to understand that customer in real time and make sure that we only show them the right promotion records or whatever the next best action is or whatever that is gonna match according to these solutions or these, you know, whatever we wanna configure these in. And we can set certain things like that. And that's all great. All right, why did I go down this tangent? The reason back over here is because I was trying to create a bit of personalized content for an email. And yeah, sure, I could have created it just for a bit of you know recommendation of blogs, but guess what I can do? I can add another block. And I can say, I want to create a bit of content that's not just about the next best blog. I want to have in the email the next best action, offer, promotion. Think about, for those of you who use Marketing Cloud today, right, just doing email campaigns, think about it, say, how you might do that. You have to use dynamic content. You've got to prepare your data extensions to make sure that you've got the right thing so that you're, you're, you've, got the next, you, you know, you've got the right call to action, the button based on the data you have. It's a lot of work. Here, it's just made easy, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, uh, what is it I wanna do? I wanna base, base it based on a promotion. Is it static? No, it's not. I do not wanna select a specific promotion. Do I want it dynamic? No, I wanna leverage machine learning, Einstein decisions, right? What is the content zone? I prepared one earlier, other content zone, and that's it. Is there a fallback item, right? In case someone doesn't quite match, is there something you want them to, to specify? Yep, sure, let's, let's do this one, whatever. Done. So now I've actually got two blocks. One that's going to provide recommended products, articles, blog posts, whatever, and another one with a recommended call to action. What is the end result of all doing this? Well, I'm going to jump back to one that I prepared earlier. 
right? Here, I have my next best thing, right? That's gonna be in my email. And I have my recommended blog post. The end result, firstly, allows me to simulate what it's gonna look like with this user, where they get this call to action and these recommended blog posts. And I can go, that's great, but what about uh, this person? What do they get? They get speak with Michael yeah, and they get these things here. That's nice. And what about uh, this person here, right? They get this, this call to action and that's all wonderful. All right, I'm gonna publish that and ultimately I'm gonna go show HTML. And these are my different content blocks. I'm gonna hit combine just to make it easy. I'm gonna copy and over here inside of my email editor, right? I'm just gonna drag and drop a HTML block. There it is. And I'll just paste it in. Now there is an extra step that you have to do, right? You need to tell it what is the user, right? In this case, I've, I've hacked it, I've just passed email. That's not best practice. You would pass a user ID. Uh, and then the end result, of course, is that, again, talking to the people at the back of the room, I know you're all looking at me going, but this is like Einstein Rex. No, it's not. Because look, it's not just about product, right? Now what we're seeing, if I just jump on over to, uh, we'll go and preview and test this with a live person or a live set of uh, audience here. If I haven't timed out, oh, have I timed out? Oh, I might have timed out. Go ahead and refresh there. While it's refreshing, what we're gonna see is a content block that is not just recommended blog posts or recommended products, but also the next best action. So think about it from the perspective of, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, right? You're, you're in marketing cloud, you're doing your journeys, you're doing your emails, you're doing your mobile campaigns. That's great. What content do you put in there? Today, you need to rely on things like decision splits, random splits, right? And you're testing all that different content. You, you, you think you're right, you know, you're testing, you measure and optimize, whatever. This is gonna give you the ability to use machine learning, right? To leverage what they've been engaging with online or any channel for that matter, which we haven't touched on too much. Um, and just get the, yeah, get the best possible outcome. So we'll jump back over to here. We'll jump back over to here. And I'll go ahead and we'll choose this uh, data extension to preview that I prepared earlier. And so this particular person has a certain affinity and their affinity tells me that the next best action is actually to view case studies, right? And that this is actually the next best blog articles to look at, right? Whereas this person, uh, Natalie Catalano, needs to speak with a marketing cloud expert today because their affinities lie strongly towards marketing cloud and they, et cetera, et cetera, fit rules. And these are the types of articles I wanna recommend. Whereas this person is gonna get these articles and so on and so forth. So that brings us to the end of open time email campaigns and promotions. I kind of touched on that. I'm going to touch on one more thing and then we'll part, hand over to uh, Josephine and then we'll open up for questions. Triggered campaigns. Now I need to do this because I know there's a lot of people in the room and online who have been working with Marketing Cloud for many years, uh, as have I. And I've been through the journey of manual triggers and then behavioral triggers and that's great. But come on, I mean, Interaction Studio has the tag on the site. It's got all this rich data. What can we do with it in terms of triggers, right? And that's where I'm gonna introduce over here, the triggered campaign. So when we click on this, let's go ahead and click new. And I'm gonna get this interface again. I don't have access to the website, that's fine. And there's, there's abilities, but what I'm basically able to do, I'm just gonna spend my time here and add, add trigger. I can create a campaign essentially, basically a triggered event based on any of these things. So a segment join. When someone joins a segment, that's a trigger, go do something. When someone leaves a segment, a card abandonment, a browse abandonment, an event action, any event. So think about in a site map, your customer might go, hey, when someone does blah, some obscure, can we trigger a blah, blah, blah? And the answer is yes. Catalog, okay, so for retailers especially, right? Think about the catalog, think about the different SKUs. When an item in high engagement category, when visitors, reach visitors when new items are added in one of their high engagement categories. That's not like explicitly if they've purchased or if they've added to favorites. That's just, if there's a category of like running shoes that someone is highly engaged in, the moment that a new item drops, let's have a trigger. 
right? And that trigger will go off and personalize a website. It will go and trigger a marketing cloud journey, whatever you like. Product back in stock, right? That's often a common one. Expiring soon, right? If your products or articles, or whatever it is, have expiry dates, that's an interesting one. Price reduction, right? These are all out of the box ones, right? So I can choose something like this, product back in stock, and I just get all these great out of the box features. So I can choose uh, this here, reach visitors when a product is back in stock, the trigger job is gonna run every hour, and these are the criteria, right? It's gotta be back in stock, there's rules, right? So there's a lot of inbuilt uh, tool tips that are gonna help you as you're building it out. How far back should the activity look, right? That's important. You don't wanna go be targeting people who two months ago were looking at something and maybe they're interested, right? So maybe just target those in the last 14 days. How many times do they need to be looking at that product for me to bother, right? Because, you know, this is important, right? Personalization is about making sure you get the right message, right customer, right times is a mantra. But if I accidentally click on a product and then click back, whoops, I don't want that accidental tap on my phone to be all of a sudden I start getting annoying things that have to do with an oven or something, right? That I have no interest in because it was an accident, right? So I want to say, well, they have to spend at least 15 seconds. And there's a sort by, and I can apply additional filters, right? I may not want to trigger this for absolutely every single product, right? Maybe I only want to trigger for high value items, right? Don't do it for things that are worth $2. Maybe I might want to do it for certain, and again, all these dimensions here, these are all custom, these are all configured for Elliot, right? It doesn't quite make sense, but they're all there available uh, for. Behavioral filters is also great. So just think about now, for those of you who have configured marketing cloud, behavioral triggers, or in the old days, right? This is completely overhauling all that, right? And this is the way of the future here. Um, we want to limit it to those users who did or did not view, add to cart, purchase, get recommendations for even, right? Or maybe favorite, whatever it might be. Um, a product or a, you know, whatever, at most, at least, there's a number of different um, things here. There's item frequencies, there's campaign, Frequency limits, right? We want to make sure this trigger is not triggering too much to spam our users. Uh, lots of great rich features here. Now, in the interest of time, there is a whole heap here which we just don't have time to do, but that's okay because in the survey at the end, if you want to go deeper into this in a future session, you can tell us. It's 12 past eight, and I'm conscious of we don't have time for questions. So I'll wrap up there. We have covered catalog. We then went into segmentation and, show, and showed all the rich ways we can create these segments, not just for web campaigns, but to trigger into email or to service other channels. Machine learning with recipes and promotions and decisions, open time email campaigns um, and triggered campaigns. So with that, I'll stop talking because I've been talking for a good half an hour now. And you're probably sick of my voice. And Josephine, if you're on the line, I'll hand back over to uh, you to do your data architecture and deep dive. And I'll go ahead and just pause my thing. Yes. Lovely. Thank you, Chris. That was very exciting. Uh, just hold on a moment, Matt. Mm -hmm. Yep. We're actually running out of time tonight, which is a little sad. <laughs> okay. Because they only booked the room until 8.15, which is, I've just found out in one and a half minutes time. What happens at 8.15? I don't know. Nick, can you tell us what happens at 8.15? Until the lights return on. Until the lights <laughs> return on. <laughs> He's gone away. He's gone to find out. He's All right, if the lights out. go off, then we apologize for those online. But for those in the room, we will have a disco party. So let's pretend it doesn't. And over to you, Josephine. And if it does cut out, Josephine, we'll uh, bring your stuff in into the next session. And we, session. Will, we will do a follow-up session really, really soon. I promise. All right. Go ahead. I've stopped sharing my screen. You can share yours now, Josephine. Okay. okay, let's jump into data ingestion. So this is relating to the data architecture part that I was talking about before. And we're going to look a little bit more into it. All right, let's start with ETLs. So I've seen there's been some questions around product ETLs. And um, this topic is relating to that. Um, I will touch on user ETLs more than anything else. Um, but what I wanted to start off with saying is that ETLs, which stands for Extract Transform Load, um, you use that to import data into Interaction Studio from external data sources. And this can be automated in Salesforce Marketing Cloud Automation Studio. And I think this is great to know because if you're new to an implementation, this might not be like an obvious way to do things. However, this is, in my opinion, the best way of pushing 
new data um, of your users into Interaction Studio. Then along with the user ETL, you have all of these other ETLs as well as a product, promotion, account, etc. that you can also utilize. But I'll touch on user ETLs tonight. Okay, so we want to prepare user data in Marketing Cloud and this is relating to data architecture. So what I wanted to say was um, to recommend to have your data sources and user data sets planned out and available to use in Marketing Cloud. What does that mean? For example, you have your CRM somewhere, your database separately to Marketing Cloud. Make sure that you have planned out the data that you need to use for your use cases in Interaction Studio and have them readily available in Marketing Cloud if you're going to push them through the user ETL, for example. So how do you do this? Well, you can use SQL queries to sort out your data prior to ingestion. And then you can use Marketing Cloud's Automation Studio to create an automatic process to export data from a data extension and load it into Interaction Studio. The data extension needs to be configured according to the requirements of the ETLs, and all of that information is readily available on the resource pages that Salesforce provides. And the picture down here is um, an example of how your automation might look like, um, but it really depends on your um, data setup. Okay, and let's talk about some important considerations about this. Uh, so I would recommend to carefully review CRM data structure. Um, for example, what CRM objects do you need to include to reach your current and future use cases? Um, I would also recommend to um, plan like the structure, um, your user data to avoid uh, duplicates, for example. And to explain that a little bit more, um, you will need to clean your data prior to ingestion to avoid IS to pick which record to use. And I'm gonna talk about this on, more on the next slide. Um, and then the next point, so if your CRM sits within SFTC, and this is a great recommendation, by the way, guys. So um, if you want, you can take notes, um, is to push only new records through the user ETL, because if you have the integration from SFTC, AKA Service Cloud or Sales Cloud um, into Interaction Studio, it's super simple to set up, and it means that you can update your user records directly through that integration instead of having to push them through the user ETL in Marketing Cloud. And anyone that works within Marketing Cloud knows that there's like runtime errors and so on that can happen in Automation Studio if there's like large amount of data coming through. And then I would also recommend to keep a log to check against prior to ingestion. Okay, so then the deduping um, tip section for user data. So dedupe uh, stands for deduplication. And what it means is that it removes redundant copies before sending to the ETL. And an example of this is if the user identity is an email address and there are several contacts with the same email address, Interaction Studio will deduplicate on a random basis and only choose one record to be created as a user. Deduplicating prior to ingestion provides more control of which contact is created as it doesn't rely on IS to select. So this is for like new um, records, just to be clear with everyone. And the way to control this is to apply SQL rules of which records to select. This could be, for example, to select like the reason modified date um, of your records. If anyone has worked within like um, Salesforce CRM in the past, you know that that is one of the data points that you can use. Um, so this is just like a tip from me to everyone that um, this is how you like regain control a little bit, just in case it would be duplicates that would be coming through. So you would make sure that you deduplicate before you push that into IS. Uh, but that's getting a little bit technical. Um, and you can see an example of the code below. Okay, thank you guys. That was all from me. Thanks, Josephine. That brings us to the end of tonight's uh, presentation, demonstration. As we said, it, it's really been an overview, right? This is the first session that we've actually had on marketing cloud personalization. And appreciating that there are people in the room from all facets and all experiences. So for those of you who have never seen it before, I hope this was a great 
of overview for those who are familiar with it. Hopefully you've seen some other ways and different uh, ways to sort of leverage the platform. However, we have not gone super deep on different areas. And that was by design. This is the first session, right? Introductory. So what we're going to do at the end of um, the session, there will be a survey that will go around called what topics would you like to know more about? Uh, Matt, are we going to do an in-person uh, hand raising or are we going to do it all pure virtual after the fact? Online, it's free. Um, so I share my screen. Yeah. The results so far. Let's do it. And before I do that, I'm just getting the wrong down to share. Can we get the back up? Yes. So the guys online have been using the so for those of you who haven't done this, scan it, just fill out what would you what you would like to learn uh, more about, and we've got a live survey results. We do. Is that what that's great. Is that what that graph was? Oh yes, it's a good slide. And we've got the room until nine now. So great. Um thank you. So I share my screen. Share Yep. And back over here. The results. Don't need to. So we can see that. Yep, there we go. <clears throat> so that shows that shows that we've had how many people have completed the survey? We've had 30 people have a look at the survey. We've got 15 people on there, 14 people right now, 31 votes. And it's showing um, a trend. So when we started, Oh, Everything was about the same. It looks like um, architecture is winning the race, closely followed by promotions and Einstein, uh, followed up third by segmentation. Oh, crikey, we've had them join together. This is just like a Zoom meeting, isn't it? It's got a happy business. Um, but we are sharing those live results as they come in. So um, I hope that helps, Chris. Yeah. Let's sure that. Fantastic. This is great. And this will stay open um, indefinitely, so... Oh, good. Oh, okay, great. Cool. All right. Are we opening up for Q&A? Yes, we've got a couple more questions online, but um, let's um, go around the room. Ah, oh, priorities to those in the room. All right. So there are questions online, but we'll open it up in the room. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to throw out there for myself or Josephine or anyone in the, in the, in the group? And Josephine, thank you for doing the Q&A in the online group too, for being talking. Thank you. Appreciate it. No worries, my pleasure. If there's any highlights, Josephine, did you want to read them out? Sorry? Are there any highlights from the Q&A? a lot of good questions um i like that there was one question around and i think i dropped out earlier so i don't know if you guys answered it or not but um it was around like how can you tra track like behavior um i think this question came in just after you showcase the um like promotional side like personalization parts um and the answer to that is through the sitemap so that's where you would capture all of like the behaviors like if there's any clicks if there's any movements on the website how long you would have spent um, time on something, um, the pages that you visited, like all of that, every single like data point that you touches or move to on the website, that's where you that you track that through the um, site map. Yeah, that was an area that we didn't cover in too much detail today. The site map was really about focusing on a content zone. How do we personalize it? But in that very same site map is where you do all the stuff that Josephine just uh, mentioned. And as I'm saying that, Josephine, I just realized, if you look at that chart, which, which item in that survey would you say most closely aligns to learning more about um, this topic? Um, that's a good question because all of them <laughs> relates, right? But I would say, I mean, architecture, um, the topics that I was talking about was both website and data architecture, which is two different things, but they go hand in hand. Website architecture, that's your sitemap. The data architecture, that's, you know, the ETLs, the data ingestion into the system, but also yeah. the capture, which then happens yeah. through the sitemap. So, yeah. Right. Okay, that's great. That, that's one of the top uh, items there. Um, we'll keep going with questions online, but we have one question in the room, which gets priority for those who come online, uh, come in person. Um, 
Yeah. So the question was, what are the industries that we see using personalization beyond retail? Uh, well, I work for Salesforce, so I've got the, the broadest answer. So I'll open up to the room. Uh, hands up those. Uh, so someone who works for someone other than retail, like put your hands up. You don't have to mention a customer name, just an industry. Go for it. Media. Media industry. Others? Yep. Education. Yes. Others? No, otherwise I'll keep talking. So, uh, financial services, obviously, yes. Great one. Others, yep. Telcos, yeah. Gambling, yes. Raid, wagering industry, yes, very true. Public sector, right? Health. Health, yes. Yep. Now online. Financial services, thank you. Yes, there are many B2B, SaaS, demand gen um, type use cases. There's there's not many, I'll be honest, like again, in my job, I speak to all different types of customers. It's quite rare and it does happen, but it's quite rare for me to speak to a customer and be like, and I don't think this is a fit. You know, it's, it, 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 that's, that's rare. What, look, that's an interesting question. The question was for those companies who don't sell as much online. All right, um, that's an interesting question. And I'll answer it with uh, two, two sides. If you don't sell anything online and in store, for example, um, is not really digital, then it's probably the best solution. However, I'll, I will tell you a story about a customer who uh, is retail, doesn't sell online, high end, high-end luxury, like so ex bloody expensive that people need to come in the store and feel and touch and speak and all the rest of it. And they use this because they know that their clients start the journey online, right? They start that journey online, they start the research online and they are exclusive. That means that they book an appointment when they come in. So what does that mean? That means that they can use this solution to track that behavior what they're researching online, what, how they're engaging with the emails, what they're chatting to their agents about, all that stuff, so that when they come in, when they come in store, because that's where they transact, from a clienteling perspective, right? So clienteling, right? You, know, you go into a, a store and there's an iPad, and they, oh yes, you're here for your one o'clock, Adam. Yes, here, here's your details. Bang, they are served with the next best action, conversation point, product, whatever it is, serviced up there. So we do have customers. Uh, not just here in Australia, across the globe, that are using it for that use case as well. Yeah, real estate. People don't buy houses online. No, they don't. Nor do they sell them online. It's relationships. Yeah, relationships, they yes. Build that relationship, you need to understand it. Yeah. Any use case where there's a lot, that, where that research starts online, and you want to empower a human being, right? Uh, with that, and not in a creepy way. You don't need to tell them. They click, 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 and this is what they did at this time. And this is, no, 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 just make it, just wrap it all up in a nice, and we didn't really focus a lot on that. It was covered very briefly in the overview, um, but that's certainly an area we can go into deeper now as to how all that works in another session. Yeah, go for it. The, the question was, how much does it cost? It costs $1. Yeah, good question. Is that a question for a developers group? I don't know. Um, all I can tell you is that there are two editions, so to speak. One's called, one is an edition that will work uh, relatively sort of standalone just for web and for email. There is another edition that is a, a larger edition, let's say, whereby you can leverage some of the connectors, right, into things like Sales Cloud and Service Cloud and all the rest of it. So um, there are those two sort of high level things. And then the, another factor, um, is a number of named profiles, meaning the number of known users that hit your site. So you might have 100,000 visitors to your site every month and 20,000 of them are known, right? So those kinds of metrics are going to impact the pricing. I'm not a salesperson, so um, I don't know the answers to, to all of that, but yeah. I think, um, thank you very much. Are there any questions online that we should answer? I think we're good for that one.
Oh, right on 8.30. Remember, um, and I think we can make room for a little bit of time. Remember uh, the survey, the top three, not the top three, but three random survey responses with their free ebook from Iraq. So don't forget to do the survey. Yes, the survey is very important. For those of you who are, have not had their questions answered, I very poorly attempted to copy paste them. Is there a way I can grab all these questions now? There is. Oh, great, because we this is not working. We sure will, and it's going to be based on the survey results and the questions. And the questions. There we go. I'll, I'll do my best to go ahead and try and answer uh, as many of these after the session, but we are out of time and right on 8.30. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for your time and for joining this evening. <laughs> Thanks, Josephine. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.